Hello and welcome to part 2 of the covariance matrix adaptation evolution strategy. Uh, previously in part 1, we looked at a simple evolution strategy that was based on iteratively updating the mean of a normal distribution. And we also looked at a simple technique for adapting the covariance matrix that was described in the Otolo tutorial. And towards the end of part 1, uh, we saw that this simple technique does not quite work and would require a bit of refinement. And that is exactly what we're, we are going to do for the next two videos. Um, we're going to look at the complete CMAS algorithm as uh, described in Hansen 2016 paper. Um, and the title of the paper is right here, so you can look it up. And here I have posted the pseudocode from page 29 of the paper. And you may observe that the main loop of the CMAS pseudocode is divided into four main sections. There's one for um, sampling. There's one for recombination, which is essentially um, updating the mean. And then there are two more sections for step size and covariance matrix adaptation. I'm going to go over the first two sections, um, that is sampling and recombination in this video. And then in part three, we are going to um, walk over the two remaining sections. So let's start with sampling. Um, to the left here, I have the pseudocode for simple evolution strategy from part one. And just for comparison, uh, I have highlighted the sampling sections from both pseudocodes, so you may check for difference. And you may immediately notice that the sampling section of the complete CMAES consists of three lines rather than just one. And moreover, um, each of these three lines built on top of the result from the previous line. So here, um, the second line pre-multiplies the first line's result uh, by this new BD term and then the third line scales the second line's result by this new small sigma term and adds back the mean. And we'll see um, what all these new terms mean in a minute. And the reason that CMAES goes for three lines for sampling instead of just one um, and thus have all these added complexity actually underlies one of the most important concepts uh, in CMAES. And that is the separation of step size from covariance matrix. But before we dive deeper into that, you should know about the affine property of Gaussian distribution, which essentially states that Gaussian distribution is closed under affine transformation. And that includes things such as scaling, um, translation, and rotation. And what that means to us is that we can manipulate the parameters of a normal distribution by, for example, taking the mean out of the sampling. And we can also take, in, take out the scaling factor out of the covariance matrix. And we can also decompose the covariance matrix and take out a component. And by the way, the tilde sign here um, is essentially the uh, equal sign for sampling. So for all these three equations, the expression on the left and right side of the tilde are equivalent. So with that out of the way, we can resume talking about the separation of step size from covariance matrix. Um, specifically, where we used to have just one covariance matrix that is labeled capital sigma, we now have um, a step size, a scaling factor, um, that is labeled small sigma, and also a quote-unquote normalized covariance matrix that is labeled C. And the three of them are related in such a way that, approximately speaking, small sigma squared multiplied by C equals capital sigma. So with all this information, and also recalling the affine property that we just talked about, if we were to look at the third of the three sampling lines, and, specific, and specifically focus on the small sigma y part, uh, hopefully it makes sense to you that uh, having C as a covariance matrix, and then scaling the sampling result by small sigma is equivalent to just having capital sigma as a covariance matrix. So we have established that these two expressions are um, equivalent. But we have yet to explain the motivation for making this separation. So why go through all this added complexity we can when we can just simply have capital sigma as the covariance matrix? Well, we need step size and covariance matrix separated because we need to adapt each of them independently. And there are a few reasons that we might want to do this. Uh, the first reason is the relative difficulty of adaptation. 
So um, step size sigma is just one number to adapt. But by comparison, covariance matrix C uh, often contains multiple numbers because it's a matrix, right? And therefore, C has higher degrees of freedom than small sigma. And intuitively, in order to find a good covariance matrix C, we need to find a good combination of all these numbers, which is often harder than finding just one single uh, step size small sigma. So by separating step size small sigma from C, we allow it to be adapted independently and therefore allow it to adapt faster. So um, that's the first reason. And for a second, more general reason, uh, we should realize that step size and covariance matrix rely on fundamentally different kinds of information and different mechanisms to adapt. So we remember from part one that covariance matrix is adapted according to the position of elite individuals. Because that gives like a general information about uh, towards which direction the higher fitness lie, right? And by comparison, small sigma can be seen as a caution metric because it decides essentially how uh, widely spread the distribution is and by extension how far we should explore along all directions in general. And in machine learning in general, um, this kind of caution metric is usually uh, adapted according to past success. So for example, if uh, we had been successful for the past few iterations, it's probably indication that we can do even better by uh, increasing the step size and kind of optimizing more aggressively. So again, um, covariance matrix relies on uh, elite positions, whereas step size relies on past success. And those are two different kinds of information. And therefore, we should allow um, the two of them to each adapt independently. And indeed, uh, as we will see in part three, CMAES has a section for adapting the step size and a section for adapting the covariance matrix. So that is the second reason. There could be more reasons, and I can think of at least one more, uh, but it's a bit trickier to explain. So um, if you want to learn more, I encourage you to uh, look at my blog on the subject, and I will provide the link in the description. Okay, we have explained why and how step size is separated from the covariance matrix, but if, you, if we were to look at the three sampling lines, we can also see that for the first two lines, we've been working with a centered distribution. So the mean of the um, distribution is zero. And only in the third line do we add back the mean. And this is actually a fairly common thing to do when we are manipulating a uh, normal distribution because it simplifies our calculations greatly. And in our case, um, it simplifies the calculation for uh, the covariance matrix, because if you remember from part one, uh, covariance matrix is calculated according to this equation. Uh, and if the mean m is zero, um, this equation simplifies to this. I haven't explicitly talked about this, but if you were to um, look at the three sampling lines again, what we're doing by separating the sampling into three lines is that we are dividing a big sampling into smaller uh, submodules. And the benefit of this is that we can uh, combine the smaller modules to get kind of the equivalent result as having just one big module. But in the meantime, we can also take each of the submodule and do things with it independently. So we just talked about um, how separating the step size from covariance matrix allows us to um, adapt each of them independently. And it's the same thing with separating the mean from the sampling. And we will see soon that by um, having the first two lines work with center distribution and only adding back the mean on the third line, uh, we can take the second line and use it to calculate the uh, covariance matrix, as is the case here, which gives us the benefit of simplified calculation. And we can also use the third line for the final individuals that we feed into the evaluation environment and get back the fitness. So kind of the best of both worlds here. 
So hopefully that all makes sense, why we uh, separated the step size and the mean from the sampling. And that leaves us with one last thing to explain before we wrap up the sampling section. And that is the meaning of this new BD term on the second line. Well, personally, I don't think it's going to be uh, terribly important for understanding the CMAS algorithm in general. It's mostly a mathematical thing meant to accelerate computations. So in short, uh, the new BD term comes from the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix C, such that uh, B multiplied by D squared multiplied by B inverse uh, is equal to C. And because B is orthogonal, we can simply replace the B inverse with B transpose. So given the definition of BD and also some additional derivations as explained in uh, Hansen 2016, page six, um, we can see that pre-multiplying the sampling result by BD is equivalent to pre-multiplying by C to the power of one half. And if we re remember the affine property of normal distribution, that is in turn equivalent to multiplying a C into the covariance matrix. So now we have everything we need in order to understand the sampling section. And I'm just going to quickly go over it again. In the first line, we sample from a centered isotropic normal distribution. And in the second line, we pre-multiply by this new BD term to incorporate the um, covariance matrix C into our sampling. So our sampling now considers directional information. And then in the third line, um, we scale the second line's result by uh, the scaling factor small sigma. So now our uh, normal distribution considers the step size as well. So now not only does it know uh, towards which direction does it want to bias the sampling, it also knows um, how far in general do we want to sample from the mean. And finally, we add back the mean. So the whole thing is padded and we get uh, an individual that is ready to be fed into the evaluation environment and get back the fitness. So that's it for the sampling section. Okay, we can now proceed to the next section, which is recombination. Um, this section handles the mean update. And conveniently, it doesn't add much on top of the um, mean update that we had in our simple yes. There are two minor differences. The first one is that instead of averaging the raw individuals, we now average the displacements from the mean. So you might remember from part one that when doing the mean update, we were averaging all the raw individuals xi. So now instead of that, we are averaging yi, which is from the second line of the sampling. And this can be seen as a standardized version of xi because, well, you can remember how, um, how we got from the second line to the third line, right? We scale yi by the uh, scaling factor small sigma and then add back the mean. So if we were to invert that operation, we get the standardization equation. Well, I can't think really, I, well, I can't really think of a way that this operation is superior to uh, what we had before. I guess it's just a notational thing. But anyways, that is the first difference. For the second difference, um, whereas before, in simple yes, we average only the top mu individuals when doing the mean update, uh, now we average all individuals. So again, uh, recall from part one that we were, um, when we were updating the mean, we sort all individuals by their fitness and only take the top mu individuals as our elites, and then we do a fair average across all these top mu individuals. So that's how we uh, give the elites more weights when doing the mean update in part one. Well, instead, in CMA, yes, we consider all individuals and we give the elites more weight by quite literally doing a weighted average and giving the elites more weights. And the convenient thing is that if we know the generation size beforehand and therefore know how many individuals we're going to need to average, we can just calculate the weights beforehand and keep reusing that set of weights throughout evolution. So for example, if we have a generation size of 10, uh, we can just uh, compute 10 weights at the start of evolution according to some kind of power law distribution. You know, the kind that decays exponentially. Uh, and then in each generation, we just sort the individuals according to their fitness. And then the fittest individual gets the highest weight. And the second fittest individual gets the highest, the, the second highest weight and et cetera, and et cetera. 
using a weighted average over all individuals rather than the fair average over only the elite individuals not only gives us um, a way of a finer control over which individuals do we want to give more focus, it also allows us to learn from bad individuals. So for example, we can just give the bad individuals um, negative weights so that they can be used to learn a bad direction that we do not want to reproduce. So as before, we do a quick recap on the section before we wrap up. In the first line, in the recombination section, uh, we do a weighted average of the displacements, where the displacements come from the second line in the uh, sampling section, and the weights come from uh, pre-computed values. And the two of them are coupled together in such a way that um, those who have higher fitness get larger weights. And then we take the um, averaged displacement and we scale it by the step size uh, and add it to the old mean to get the new mean. And this new CM term is the learning rate that controls how fast do we want to change the mean value. And it's just a hyperparameter that you can define at the start. So with that, we conclude the second part of the CMA YES series. And in the next video, part three, we're going to go over the two remaining sections. Um, so I guess have a nice day and I'll see you in the next video.